This is a Scream Queen production. I'm Jen Carpenter, and this is So Dead Podcast. Happy True Crime Tuesday, Deadheads. Welcome to episode 50 of So Dead. That's right, guys. 50 full-length episodes of me mispronouncing words and swearing unnecessarily. It's been a crazy ride for sure, uh, but it's been so much fun. And I want to just take a minute today to thank all of you for being a part of this with me. You know, I have been a storyteller for most of my life, but putting myself out there in this way has been a totally different experience. It's been daunting. Uh, Podcasts are a lot of work, like a lot of work, Uh, but the response to So Dead has been so phenomenal, and that is the thing that definitely keeps me going when I start to question my life choices, which, let's be honest, I do quite a bit. So, to celebrate the 50th episode of So Dead, I did want to do something special. Now, I had a couple of surprises and announcements that were planned for today's episode, but this whole social distancing, distancing, already, already, and I'm not even into the story yet. Um, This whole social (laughs) distance, I promise I'm not doing it on purpose. I'm tired, guys. I'm not sleeping a lot these days. I'm sure like a lot of you. Ah, Let's try that again. This whole social distancing thing put the kibosh, is it kibosh or kibosh, whatever, I say kibosh, on kind of all of the things that I was working on and all of the things that I had planned. So those surprises are just going to have to wait for another day. Uh, One of them involves changes that I'll be making to the podcast in coming weeks, and then the other involves a new super exciting top secret project that I'm working on. So once the world has stopped burning and life begins to normalize a little bit for all of us, I'm going to be moving forward with some pretty fun things, so I want you guys all to stay tuned for that. I tried to come up with a theme for today to celebrate 50 episodes, and I actually got some really good suggestions from friends and some really weird ones. Um, I thought about the, the only thing I could come up with was to do something that happened 50 years ago or something that happened in 1950. I had one of my friends suggest that I do a serial killer that killed exactly 50 victims, which that would be pretty hard to do, I think, because most serial killers are liars. Some of them underestimate to hide the true nature of their crimes and the true number of their victims, and some of them overestimate because they're fucking narcissists and they want the glory for having killed X number of people um, when their numbers aren't actually quite that high. So I think it'd be hard to find someone that killed exactly 50 people, but I also did not really try. Sorry. I had suggestion to do someone that killed people over the age of 50, which to me that would just be really sad. Um, But those were all really good ideas. None of them like jumped out at me though as this is the thing. This is what I want to do. So Uh, I reached a point where I just decided I was going to do something that I want to do. Which, I mean, honestly, that's all the podcast is anyway, right? Me talking about whatever shit I feel like talking about. So today's episode is going to be just a little bit more self-indulgent than usual because we are going to be talking about one of my favorite topics. Favorite, favorite. uh, The Titanic. More specifically, passengers on the Titanic that were bound for Michigan. And this story idea, when I decided I wanted to do this, I wasn't really sure how it was going to all shake out um, because I didn't really know a lot about Titanic's ties to Michigan, and I wasn't sure how interesting of a story it would actually wind up making. But holy shit, you guys, I am obsessed with all of what is about to happen today, and so I hope you guys are too. And then in a very strange twist of, I don't know, fate, whatever, coincidence, whatever you want to call it, Um, It didn't dawn on me until after I decided to cover Titanic for the 50th episode that this episode is actually going to release on April 7th, which is just a few days ahead of Titanic's anniversary. So yeah, we're just three days away from the 108th anniversary of Titanic setting sail on its doomed maiden voyage. Uh, And obviously also then just a few more days than that away from the anniversary of Titanic sinking 
which, as we all know, resulted in a horrific loss of life. And just a reminder for those of you not keeping track, Titanic is my favorite movie of all time. I saw it in the theater several times, uh, which that was a commitment because that's a long fucking movie. And I saw it at least four or five times in the theater. I don't remember if I told you guys this, but it's one of my favorite Titanic stories. Uh, My best friend Trini and I went and saw the movie together opening weekend, maybe even opening day. I'm not sure. We were in high school and we came home from the movie to my house and my dad was in the kitchen when we walked in the door and we were both all, you know, red eyed and you could tell we'd been crying. And he was like, well, what's wrong with you guys? And I said, we just got back from Titanic, dad. And he said, well, shit, didn't you know the ship was going to (laughs) sink? But anyway, that's just my dad. Um, So, yeah, I when I say it's my favorite, I was obsessed when it first came out. I wore the heart of the ocean to my senior prom. I had a ton of fangirl memorabilia. I still do. And if I ever happen across Titanic when it's on TV, there goes my whole day because I'm just going to sit and watch all of it. But I digress. It's been 84 years. Sorry. (laughs) It was really cheesy. Sorry, I had to do it, you guys. Um, no, it's actually been 108 years, which I just told you. Get with the program. Um, it's been 108 years since the RMS Titanic set sail from Southampton, a city in southeast England, bound for New York City. Now, I'm going to keep the history lesson portion of this episode short because it's Titanic. You guys know this. Uh, and if you don't, what are you even doing with your lives? Titanic was one of three luxury ocean liners owned by the White Star Line in the early 1900s, and it was marketed as the largest, most luxurious passenger liner capable of transatlantic travel. It was built in Belfast, Ireland by the Harland and Wolfe Shipyard. 3,000 carpenters, engineers, electricians, plumbers, painters, mechanics, and interior designers spent over two years constructing the ship. It was touted as unsinkable because the double-plated hull was equipped with 16 watertight compartments with doors that would automatically close if water entered them. So even if something happened, they could contain the problem quickly and keep the ship afloat. So if, say, I don't know, the ship sideswiped an iceberg or something, the doors would seal on the damaged compartments and the flooding would then be limited to that compartment, the one that received the damage. Uh, In fact, Titanic was built to survive the flooding of four of the compartments, which was a highly unlikely event, but it couldn't survive the flooding of five. Not five. I'm sorry. I'm just going to apologize now because I am going to quote the movie probably a couple hundred times during the episode. It's inevitable. Uh, I'm not even going to try to fight it. So let's move on. Titanic was nearly 900 feet long. Uh, That is almost the length of three football fields, unless Google lied to me about the length of football fields. Uh, And the ship had seven passenger decks, A through G. It was built to accommodate a maximum of 3,547 passengers and crew members. Uh, So it wasn't quite at capacity for its maiden voyage when it set sail with just over 2,200 people aboard. Tickets ranged in price from $15 to $40 for third-class passengers, which today would be about 170 to 450 um, or up to $4,350 for a first-class parlor suite, which that in today's money would be over $50,000. There were people that paid $50,000 to sail on Titanic, which is insane. Modeled after the Ritz, Titanic had restaurants and swimming pools and gymnasiums and, of course, that gorgeous grand staircase. What there weren't a lot of, as we all know, were lifeboats. Because why does an unsinkable ship need lifeboats cluttering up the deck? Titanic had a total of 20 lifeboats. There were 14 standard boats that had a capacity of 65 people each. There were four collapsible boats with a capacity of 47 people each. And two emergency cutters that had a capacity of 40 each. So... If you're good at math, which I am not, that is a total of 1,568 lifeboat seats available. Thank you, calculator. And that's if all of the lifeboats were to be deployed at full capacity. Which means that if the unthinkable were to happen, 
and the unsinkable boat sank, not everyone would survive. Hey, but at least it looked pretty, right? The plan was for Titanic to sail from England to the U.S. across the Atlantic Ocean every three weeks. It would leave Southampton at noon on a Wednesday, make stops in Cherbourg, France, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right, and then also in Queenstown, Ireland, and then it would arrive in New York by the following Wednesday, so each trip would take about a week. With thousands of tickets sold for its maiden voyage, Titanic didn't make its trial run until April 2nd, 1912, so about a week before it was due to set sail, uh, and it was tested for speed, turn, and emergency stop capabilities. At 8 o'clock that night, after it passed sea trials, Titanic set sail for Southampton. From April 3rd through April 10th, Titanic was loaded with supplies and the crew was hired and trained. On April 10th, 1912, passengers began to board Titanic at 9.30 a.m. And then at 12 noon, with over 2,200 souls on board and Captain Edward J. Smith at the helm, the largest, most luxurious ocean liner in history set sail while the world watched. She arrived in Cherbourg, France at 6.30 that night, picked up more passengers, and then left at 8.10 p.m. She arrived in Queenstown, Ireland at 11.30 a.m. the next day, picked up even more passengers, and then at 1.30 p.m. on April 11th, Titanic left port at Queenstown for its trip across the Atlantic headed for New York City. All went swimmingly at first. See what I did there? They ate, they danced, they sunbathed, they watched for dolphins, Jack and Rose fell in love. But a few days later, about halfway through the trip, it all went to shit. At 11.40 p.m. on April 14th, lookout Frederick Fleet spotted an iceberg coming up fast and shouted the famous line, Iceberg, right ahead. And by right ahead, he meant that the ship only had 37 seconds to prepare for impact. Despite receiving multiple warnings from other ships of icebergs in the area, and despite the fact that the lookout's binoculars were locked away and no one could find the key, Titanic was moving full steam ahead through the dead of night. First Officer Lieutenant William Murdoch ordered a hard starboard turn, and the ship veered to the left as quickly as she could for a 50,000-ton hunk of steel, but it was too late. The entire right side of Titanic scraped the iceberg, in a collision so minor that it didn't even wake most of the passengers. But this sideswipe actually turned out to be worse than if the ship had just hit the iceberg head on, because the iceberg poked holes along the entire side of the ship, which caused multiple compartments to begin flooding at once, instead of just one or two, or even three or four, because Titanic could have survived four flooded compartments, but not five. Within 20 minutes, it had been determined that the ship would sink. Just after 12 a.m. on April 15, 1912, Captain Smith was informed that the unsinkable ship would be at the bottom of the ocean within a couple of hours. Five minutes later, the crew began preparing the lifeboats and loading women and children first. And we all know how that went. We've all seen the movies, right? It was absolute chaos as panicked passengers swarmed the lifeboats. Many of the boats were lowered into the ocean at less than half capacity, while the gates were locked on the third-class passengers so that the first class had the first chance to board the boats. The madness with the lifeboats continued until 2.05 a.m. when the last lifeboat was lowered into the Atlantic. Fifteen minutes later, Titanic sank. Out of the 2,200 passengers on board, only about 700 had made it into the lifeboats, even though there was room for double that. The rest were trapped in the belly of the ship, or tossed into the 28-degree water when Titanic went down. Less than a dozen people were rescued from the water after the ship sank. Uh, the exact numbers do vary depending on where you look, but the number of people aboard Titanic ranges from 2,223 to 2,229. The number of survivors seemed a bit more consistent depending on where I looked. Again, um, most sources reported that 705 people survived, but I've seen that number range from 701 to 713. So, I mean, there, there's a slight margin for error here, but roughly 70% of Titanic's passengers died when the ship sank over 12,000 feet to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. 70% of 2,200 people. That is insane. Of those 2,200 passengers, 69 of them were bound for Michigan. 
And that is actually the focus of today's episode. No matter how long I could spend talking about how Jack and Rose definitely could have both fit on that fucking door. Am I right? So I'm going to start close to home and I'm going to tell you guys about Lansing, Michigan's connection to Titanic. His name was Frederick Ware. Frederick was born in London, England in 1877. In December of 1904, when he was 27, he married Cecilia Still at St. Peter's Church in Greenwich. Five years later, in 1909, the couple immigrated to Lansing, where Frederick got a job at the new REO Motor Car Company plant on South Washington Avenue. In late 1911, the couple went home to England to visit family. In the spring of 1912, Frederick booked a third-class ticket on Titanic to return to Lansing. Cecilia was to follow a few months later. But Frederick did not survive the sinking of the Titanic, and his body was never recovered. It is believed that he was one of the third-class passengers who was trapped below deck by locked doors and blocked exits. He never had a chance. Cecilia did return to Lansing, however. She arrived in 1913, just a year after her husband's death. She remarried, she raised a family in a home on Francis Street, and she died in 1966 as Cecilia Vincent. She is buried in Mount Hope Cemetery in Lansing. So there you have it, guys, the Capital City's connection to Titanic. This next story, though, is bananas, like B-A-N-A-N-A-S, bananas. This is the story of the only first-class Michiganders on Titanic. 25-year-old Dickinson Bishop, who went by Dick, had already seen his fair share of tragedy before boarding the doomed ship. Just two years prior, his first wife, Mary, died during childbirth at the age of 22. The couple's daughter, Pauline, lived only 10 minutes. Mary came from a wealthy family, and when she died, she left Dick a major share in the Round Oak Stove Company of Dowagiac, which is a city in southwest Michigan. So if you're looking at your hand as the state of Michigan, it's kind of down by your outer wrist bone, I guess you would say. And I do want to point out that the only reason I know how to pronounce Dowagiac is because I used to work in a hotel, uh, a motel, really, let's be honest. And we had a crew of guys that did work in the Lansing area for several months, and they were all from Dowagiac. So otherwise, I would just be slaughtering that word because it's spelled real weird. So anyway, Dick was a young, wealthy widower when he met 18-year-old Helen Walton from a well-to-do family in Sturgis, Michigan. The couple married on November 7, 1911, just a little over a year after Dick's first wife and daughter had died. Uh, And then after the Christmas holiday, the newlyweds embarked on a four-month worldwide honeymoon to locations including Egypt, Italy, France, and the Algiers. They purposely timed their return to the U.S. so that they would be able to sail on the maiden voyage of Titanic. In first class, of course. But the couple was not alone. They had two new family members with them, a puppy that Helen had adopted during their travels and a fresh bun in the oven. Although it is unclear whether the bishops were aware that 19-year-old Helen was pregnant when they boarded Titanic, because when I say that this was a fresh bun in the oven, it was fresh, Um, like fresh, fresh. Uh, When Titanic collided with the iceberg, Helen was asleep in bed and Dick was reading in his stateroom. He awoke his young bride, and the couple dressed and went out onto the deserted deck, where they were told that there was nothing to worry about and to return to their room. So they did. A little while later, a friend they'd made on the ship knocked on the door. He expressed concern that Titanic was now tilting a bit and seemed to be sinking. So they returned to the deck, and this time the scene was a bit different. There were more people mulling about, and the crew no longer seemed unconcerned. In fact, they told the bishops to go back to their room and get their life vests. The bishops returned to their stateroom one final time to retrieve their life vests and whatever valuables they could carry on their persons. While there, Helen made a heartbreaking decision. She knew that the ship was full of families that needed saving. Mothers with young children, infants just months old, and she was worried about how she would be perceived walking around with money stuffed in her pockets and a puppy in her arms. So she left the puppy behind, locked in her room, which makes me really sad. Dick and Helen arrived back on deck just in time for the first lifeboat, 
boat number seven, to begin loading. A crew member called out, all brides and grooms may board. And then, before she knew what was happening, Helen was lifted into the lifeboat. She is actually believed to have been the very first person to board one of the lifeboats. So she was the first rescued soul. Her husband climbed in with her, along with at least three other newly married couples the bishops had met aboard the ship. So women and children first didn't start until after first class newlyweds first, apparently. Many of the passengers on deck declined the opportunity to board the lifeboat. It was very high up in the air, and it would have to be lowered down alongside the entire height of the ship. So I am sure that that was fucking terrifying. I would have been terrified because I'm, I'm so afraid of heights. And most people at this point were still skeptical that the ship was going to sink. In fact, as she sat in the lifeboat waiting for others to board, Helen saw John Jacob Astor, the world's wealthiest man, and a fellow first-class passenger, assuring others that the ship was not going to sink. At 12.45 a.m., Lifeboat 7 was lowered with just 28 passengers on board, less than half the number it was designed to hold. Among them were just three crew members, which meant that the passengers had to help row to get the boat as far from Titanic as possible before it sank. French aviator Pierre Marchal was seen rowing with his monocle still firmly in place, looking like the fucking Monopoly man over there, and then a man pretending to be a German baron who called himself Baron von Drachsted refused to help row, and he just sat silently and smoked a cigar while the rest of the people on the boat tried to save their own lives. To help calm her fellow passengers, Helen told them a story. While she and Dick were in Egypt, they visited a fortune teller. The fortune teller told Helen that she would survive a shipwreck and an earthquake before an automobile accident would end her life. Fucking dark and morbid for a honeymoon, but okay. So, Helen told the rest of the passengers, we have to be rescued for the rest of my prophecy to come true. And the bishops, along with the rest of the occupants of Lifeboat 7, did survive. Dick and Helen returned to Duwajiak, and on December 8, 1912, eight months after Titanic sank, they welcomed a son, Randall Walton Bishop, a baby who died just two days after he was born. And things only went downhill from there, because that Egyptian fortune teller's prediction would prove to be eerily accurate. After surviving the shipwreck, the bishops survived an earthquake while vacationing in California. And then on November 15, 1913, the couple was returning to Duwajiak from a trip to Kalamazoo when Dick lost control of the car and struck a tree. Helen was left with a severely fractured skull and she was not expected to survive. She pulled through, although she was left severely disabled with a metal plate in her head. Caring for a disabled wife was not what Dickinson Bishop had signed up for, of course, and the couple divorced in January of 1916. Two months later, Helen fell while visiting friends. She died from her injuries on March 16, 1916, at the age of 23, and was buried in her family plot in Sturgis. An article announcing her death appeared on the front page of the Duwajiak Daily News. That same day, an article announcing Dickinson Bishop's third marriage appeared on the same page. Dick Bishop, indeed. A shipwreck, an earthquake and an automobile accident that ultimately ended her life. So, yeah, crazy. Michigan's first-class couple killed by a honeymoon prophecy. One thing that I found really interesting that I guess I never considered is how the White Star Line sold so many tickets for Titanic's maiden voyage. Of course, there were the Richie Riches that were just ready and waiting to drop tens of thousands of dollars to say that they were the first to set sail on Titanic, uh, but those second and third class cabins needed to be filled also. To do that, White Star Line entered into partnerships with businesses in the U.S. looking for workers. So there were actually White Star Line employees recruiting workers in Ireland and England to travel to the U.S. and then have them do that uh, via Titanic. Via? Via? I never know how to pronounce that. At least I can spell that one. So the two biggest groups coming to Michigan were a group of young men from Cornwall, England that were heading to work in the mines of Copper Country, 
and a group of farm workers from Belgium that were heading to work in the Detroit sugar beet fields. Most of the Cornwall boys were second-class passengers, while the majority of the boys from Belgium were in third class. Among the Cornwall boys was Frank Andrew, who was 26. Frank was a minor with a pregnant wife and a young daughter at home in England when he boarded Titanic, bound for Copper Country. His body was never recovered, and his wife gave birth to daughter Clara six months after Frank's passing, on October 11, 1912. Clara was one of 53 babies born posthumously to fathers who perished when Titanic sank. Another was Frederick Banfield Jr., whose father, Frederick Sr., was also a minor from Cornwall. Fred Sr. and his wife Cecilia married in 1907 and had a child that died in infancy. Fred then began traveling to the U.S. to work in the mines and had previously spent some time in Nevada. In December of 1911, Fred returned home to England for a three-month holiday, during which time his wife became pregnant again. It's unclear if Fred was aware that Cecilia was pregnant when he boarded Titanic to head to Houghton County. His body was never recovered, and his fatherless son, Frederick Jr., was born on November 15, 1912. William Carbines was just 19 years old when he bought his second-class ticket to go work in the Houghton County mines with his two older brothers. His body was recovered by the McKay Bennett, the ship that actually recovered most of the bodies from the Titanic wreck. He was listed as number 18 and was described as male, 20 years old, brown hair, wearing a dark suit, white shirt with a green stripe, knitted socks, black boots, and was found with a watch, a silver chain and charm, photographs, some loose coins, a pipe, and a knife on his person. His body was identified by his brothers before being returned to Cornwall where he was buried in the family plot. Stephen Jenkin was 32 when he boarded Titanic, headed back to Copper Country where he'd been working in the mines for years. In the summer of 1911, he returned home to Cornwall to visit family for several months. He'd already made the trip from England to Michigan multiple times, so his family found it kind of peculiar when... After he'd already left home, you know, packed all his bags, left and was headed to board Titanic, he returned home and left his valuables with his parents because he had some misgivings about the trip. His body was never recovered. And then there was the Davies family, also from Cornwall. Agnes Davies was a 48-year-old two-time widow when she boarded Titanic with her two youngest sons, Joseph and John. Agnes was born to an unwed mother in 1861, and she was orphaned as a child when her mother married, had another child, and left her behind to move to the U.S. with her new family. What kind of fucked up bullshit is that? Agnes was taken in by a local family that already had so many children that one more didn't make too much of a difference. She married in 1886 when she was 25, and she had three children with her first husband. After he passed away, she remarried in 1903 and gave birth to her fourth child, John Davies. Her second husband died in 1910, by which time most of her older children had already relocated to the U.S. So when her 19-year-old son Joseph Nichols, the youngest from her first marriage, decided that he wanted to move to Copper Country to work in the mines with his older brother, Agnes decided that she and 9-year-old John would relocate with him. She sold all of her family's belongings to purchase tickets for the Titanic's maiden voyage. Joseph would sail third class, like most of the other Cornwall boys, while Agnes and John had second class accommodations. As Titanic sank, Joseph loaded his mother and little brother into lifeboat number 14. There were about 50 other people on board, but there was room for more. Joseph asked the crew for permission to join his mother and brother on the lifeboat, but he was refused and threatened with being shot if he attempted to get in the boat. Agnes and little John survived Titanic. Joseph did not. He was body number 101, recovered by the McKay Bennett, identified as male, age 20, hair dark, gray overcoat, blue suit, blue socks, black boots, boy's brigade belt with field glasses, a gold wristwatch, two silver watches, a silver chain, a comb, a padlock, a bank book, and cash on his person. John was buried at sea, but has a headstone at a cemetery in Calumet, Michigan, beside his mother. So here is where I point out a horrific connection, if you guys haven't come to this one on your own already. 
all of the folks from Cornwall were headed to Copper Country, Houghton County, Calumet, whatever you want to call it. They were all headed to go work in the mines. Many of them perished when Titanic sank, but the ones who did make it to Copper Country had to face tragedy again just a year and a half later during the Italian Hall disaster, which was covered on episode 45 of So Dead. So little John Davies, for example, he was nine years old when he watched Titanic go down with 1,500 people, including his own brother on board. And then when he was 11, many of his friends and peers were crushed to death on Christmas Eve in the massacre at the Italian Hall. All of that trauma proved to be a little too much for John, and he actually took his own life years later. The boys from Belgium didn't fare much better than the Cornwall boys. Most of them were young man. <laughs> no, they were young man. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. Young man. Do, 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 do. I'm, just <laughs> I'm so sorry. That was so bad. I'm sorry. I'm just a little stir crazy, which I'm sure you guys can relate to. All right. Most of, no, just no. Ignore all of that and let's start over. The boys from Belgium didn't fare much better than the Cornwall boys. Most of them were young men traveling alone in third class, headed to work on the sugar beet farms near Detroit. Many of them died, but there is one very strange story of survival that I do want to share with you guys. Theodore de Mulder, 30, Jules Sapp, 25, and Jean Shearlink, 29, were all traveling together from Belgium to Detroit. De Mulder survived by throwing a chair overboard and clinging to it until a lifeboat picked him up. Sapp survived by stealing another passenger's life jacket at knife point, and Shearlink survived by hiding under the skirts of women who helped him escape to the lifeboats. Once the three men arrived safely in New York, a fellow Belgian who owned a traveling road show contracted them to travel with him and relate their Titanic stories to the masses. They were promised $5 a day each. But the showrunner uh, actually disappeared with all of the money and left the men penniless. I call that karma a little bit because a couple of them survived by, you know, pretty shady, shady means there. The White Star Line was offering all survivors free passage back to Europe. So kind of a, hey, we realize that this whole starting a new life in a new land thing didn't work out for you since half of your family died. So if you want to give up and go back home, We'll help you. Nice, I guess. So Belgium's Three Stooges took White Star Line up on that offer, and they all returned home. Uh, Jean Shearlink and Jules Sapp went back to work on local farms, and Theodore de Mulder opened a roadside cafe called Den Titanic, which just means in the Titanic. I don't know why you would call a restaurant that. Who would want to be in the Titanic that just sank and killed a whole bunch of people? The next story I have for you guys is about the Skoog family from Sweden. Wilhelm and Anna Skoog were married on June 5, 1898. Together, they immigrated to Iron Mountain, Michigan in the Upper Peninsula, where Wilhelm worked as an engineer in the mines. There, they had four children, Carl, Mabel, Harold, and Margit. Not Margaret. I'm not pronouncing it wrong. It was Margit. M-A-R-G-I-T. Little Carl loved trains, and he would often stop by the rail yard on the way to visit his father at work. As the oldest, he was tasked with taking lunch to his father every day, which he enjoyed doing because his dad would often share with him his cookies and treats. Sometimes he would hitch a ride on the back of a train toward the mines to get there quicker. On Saturday, November 2, 1907, when Carl was seven years old, he was on his way to the mines when tragedy struck. Just as he was jumping toward a train to hitch a ride, the train lurched, knocking Carl to the tracks. Before Carl could move out of the way, the train ran over his legs. Yard workers that witnessed the incident rushed Carl to the hospital, but his left leg and part of his right foot had to be amputated to save his life. Carl spent the rest of his life on crutches. In 1911, the Skoogs sold their home and all of their belongings in Iron Mountain, and they returned to Sweden. They quickly regretted that decision for some reason because four months later, friends back in Iron Mountain received a letter that read, Dear friends, we plan to return to America next month. We were fortunate to seek passage on the new and beautiful luxury liner Titanic. Our spirits soar. How wonderful it will be to see you all again. 
When the Skoog family boarded Titanic as third-class passengers, Wilhelm was 40, Anna was 43, Carl was 11, Mabel was 9, Harold was 5, and Margaret was just shy of 2 years old. Uh, She actually turned two on Titanic on April 14th, which was the day that the ship hit the iceberg. The Skoogs took with them two cousins that wanted to see what this whole U.S. of A. thing was all about. Ellen Pedersen, who was 18, and Jenny Henriksen, who was 28. The party of eight celebrated baby Margaret's second birthday on the 14th, and then they retired to their cabins. They were asleep at the time of the collision, and none of them were ever seen alive again. Only the body of Jenny Henriksen was recovered. Uh, She was body number three. I just can't. Like, that's an entire family, eight people. What had to happen? You know, Carl was severely disabled. He only had one leg, and that leg was partially amputated. He was on crutches. Even though Titanic is not a historical movie, it definitely gives a good idea of, you know, the chaos aboard the ship. It was flooding. It was tilting. So I'm sure that getting Carl anywhere or getting that many small children anywhere was a task, but for all of them to die, that's just awful to me. You almost have to wonder if they decided not to go because they couldn't all go. Kind of an all or nothing type of thing. I don't know. It's just really sad to me. And this one is even worse. Uh, here is the sad tale of the Yusuf or Joseph family from Detroit. Katrine Risk was born in Lebanon in 1886. She immigrated to the U.S. in the early 1900s and married Boutrous Yusuf in Detroit in 1904. The couple then Americanized their names and became known as Patrick and Catherine Joseph. Their son Michael was born in 1907, and their daughter Mary was born in 1909. In 1910, Catherine returned home to Lebanon with the children amid financial struggles. So the Joseph family was actually separated for quite a while, close to two years, uh, before Catherine decided to take the children back to Detroit. They were third-class passengers on Titanic. Catherine was 26, Michael was 5, and Mary was 2. They were asleep in their cabin when Catherine was awakened by the impact. With baby Mary in her arms, Catherine told Michael to hold on to her skirt as they made their way to the upper decks. And then there are two versions of what happened next. Both of them are hella traumatizing. Uh, One story is that Catherine was getting into a lifeboat with the children and she dropped Michael overboard. Fearing him drowned, she just stayed on the ship and traveled to safety with the baby. And another lifeboat actually rescued Michael from the water. The other story is that Catherine simply lost track of Michael in the commotion on the ship and got onto a lifeboat without him. A good Samaritan found the terrified little boy all by himself and put him in a lifeboat. Either way, Michael did become separated from his mother, and they weren't reunited until many hours later aboard the Carpathia, which was the ship that came and picked up the Titanic survivors. But the family's woes were far from over. By the time Carpathia arrived in New York, full of Titanic survivors, both children had contracted measles and had to be hospitalized in New York City. Once they were well... The family returned to Detroit, where Peter was waiting for them. But still, it gets worse. Once back in Detroit, the Joseph family lived above a grocery store on Congress Street, and they continued to struggle financially. On March 22, 1914, the Josephs went to the Sunday morning service at their church with son Michael, leaving four-year-old Mary asleep in her crib. While the family was gone, Michael Tony, who ran the grocery store below the apartment, heard a child screaming in agony. He rushed up the stairs, kicked open the door, and found the apartment ablaze. Little Mary, who had survived the sinking of the Titanic, was standing in the middle of the room, engulfed in flames. Mr. Tony put the fire out with his bare hands, rushed Mary downstairs, and called for an ambulance. When the Josephs returned from church, they were met by police officers who informed them of what had happened. They raced to the hospital and arrived just in time to be by Mary's side when she died. Less than a year later, in March of 1915, Peter and Catherine welcomed another daughter, Sadie. But their happiness would be short-lived, because two months later, Catherine died. And five months after that, baby Sadie died as well. Patrick followed a few years later. Only Michael, the one originally feared dead when Titanic sank, 
lived a long life. And I just, between this story and the first story and a couple more in here, I just get this major kind of Grim Reaper feel. It's really weird to me. Okay, last one. I want to end this with a survivor story, although even the survivor stories don't necessarily end happily. There is definitely like a final destination vibe to a lot of this, which is really kind of freaking me out. But this is the story of the Becker family from Benton Harbor. Alan Becker was a Lutheran pastor from Barrie in Michigan. He and his wife Nellie moved so he could do missionary work. They had three children, Ruth, Marion, and Richard. In early 1912, two-year-old Richard became ill and physicians suggested that he return to the U.S. for treatment. So 35-year-old Nellie booked second-class passage on Titanic for herself, 12-year-old Ruth, 4-year-old Marion, and 2-year-old Richard. As they boarded, Nellie became nervous about the voyage, but crew members assured her of the ship's safety and unsinkability. 12-year-old Ruth spent the first days of the journey exploring the decks of Titanic. She complained about the paint fumes in her room making her nauseous, which kind of gives a new twist to that line. You know, the, it's been 84 years and I can still smell the fresh paint. It was so fresh that it was making little kids puke. After the collision, the Becker family dressed and waited in a public room with many others where nothing was happening. So with a child in each arm and Ruth behind her, Nellie Becker climbed an iron ladder from B deck to the A deck promenade, where lifeboats were being boarded. Concerned with the cold, because remember, the whole reason they're even on this ship is because the baby's already sick, Nellie sent Ruth back to the cabin for blankets. But before Ruth returned, Nellie and the younger children were thrown into lifeboat number 11. As the lifeboat was being lowered down the side of the ship, Ruth reappeared, blankets in hand. Her mother yelled at her to get on the next boat, and a crew member helped Ruth into lifeboat number 13. Nellie spent hours searching for Ruth aboard Carpathia before they were reunited. The Beckers all survived the sinking of Titanic and settled in Benton Harbor, where Alan joined them a year later. But Ruth's relationship with her mother was strained. I don't know if I could forgive my mom if she was more concerned about how, how warm my younger siblings were than she was with, you know, whether I survived the sinking of Titanic, but hey, that's just me. Things were so bad that when Nellie died in 1961, she made Ruth the executor of her estate, but left everything to Richard. So she had to oversee her brother getting all of her mother's wealth, but she got none of it, which is a real dick move. Ruth was 85 years old when the wreckage of Titanic was discovered in 1985, and she was very against the idea of disturbing the mass grave. In 1990, when she was 90, Ruth ventured out onto the ocean for the first time since Titanic, and she took a cruise to Mexico. She died later that year, and her ashes were scattered in the Atlantic at the exact location where Titanic foundered. So when I was reading this story, I was getting the most Rose DeWitt Bacator vibes, like the talking about the smell of the paint, going back out onto the ocean as an old woman, being forever connected to that particular location. It just felt very rose to me. What do you guys think? Anyway, that is just a few of the ways that Michigan is connected to the Titanic disaster. There are more, but this is not a three-hour show. In all, there were 69 passengers with the Mitten State listed as their final destination. Only 26 of those people survived, so less than half. I will have the names of all of the Michigan passengers listed on the SODED website so you can see what class they were in, where they were traveling to. It's all really fascinating, and there are so many rabbit holes to go down. Uh, My main source for this episode was a website called EncyclopediaTitanica.com, which is a phenomenal resource and a phenomenal play on words, and I love it so much. I also got information from Wikipedia, of course, titanicfacts.net, an article on thoughtco.com, and a website called premierexhibitions.com. And that's it. Thank you for coming to my dead talk. Time for me to answer a question from a listener. This one is from Lisa. 
And her question was, how long does it take to do one episode? The research, the recording, recording? Well, a lot of time to do the editing, clearly, because I can't talk. How long it takes to do an episode? My whole life, um, <laughs> it feels like. Um, I do so much research because even, I, you know, I try, as you guys know and you're hearing, I, I try to do stories that you haven't heard or angles of common stories that you maybe haven't heard before. So I do a ton of research to get new facts so that I can tell the stories in a different way. The writing doesn't take a long time for me. That's probably the easiest part because, again, I'm a, I'm a writer. It's my thing. It's what I do. The recording takes a long time, uh, especially now that it's just me. I'm such a perfectionist that I have a hard time getting out of my own head and just kind of living in the episode. So I'm constantly redoing and redoing and redoing. The editing has actually gotten a lot easier for me recently. I, I tried. I was trying in the beginning to do it on my own uh, once the transition was made from a, a duo to a single podcaster. Uh, but I just can't. I don't have the time to do the editing. It was taking me forever, and I wasn't even that good at it, to be quite honest. So right now, I kind of do a once-over to remove all of the really embarrassing shit, and then I send it off to my friend Ben, who runs Afterlife Road, which is a YouTube channel about haunted locations in Michigan, and he does the sound editing for me, which has been a huge blessing because... I just don't need one more thing on my plate. My plate is so full, it's cracking in the middle, and we're about to have meat and potatoes all over the floor. <sighs> that was a weird thing to say. I don't know why I said it. I'm sorry. Yeah, so that's it. One episode, my whole life. I would say I spend at least a week doing the research. The writing usually takes me a day or two. Uh, the recording... If it's a 45-minute episode in the end, the actual recording probably took me almost twice that long. And then I spend a couple hours on editing, and I don't know. You'll have to ask Ben how long he spends on his part of the editing because I just don't do it anymore. When I was doing it myself, it was taking me almost a whole day to edit a full-length episode, and it was crazy. All right, so now it's time for me to thank all of the listeners that have left So Dead reviews over the past month on either Apple Podcasts or Facebook. Uh, if I've said it once, I have said it a million times. Reviews are one of the biggest factors on Apple Podcasts for rankings, visibility, etc. Uh, it is simple, it's free, and it's the best way to help the podcast grow. So if you've got a few seconds, please go and leave me a review. So from Apple Podcasts, this time around, we've got Steph B., Instinct Twins, and Krista H. And from Facebook, we've got Brianna Arndt and Lisa Owen. If you would like a shout out on the podcast, all you got to do is leave a review uh, and I will get you next month. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, and YouTube at so Dead Podcast. Please check out the Patreon page for ways to support the show financially. You can find that at patreon.com forward slash so dead podcast. And be sure to visit so podcast.com for all of your so dead merch. As always, you can email me your feedback and story ideas to so dead podcast at gmail.com. A new episode of so dead is coming your way soon. Until then, keep shining, you magnificent what the fucks. <laughs>